السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وبركاته أرحب آه بكم جميعا ونشكر لكم حضوركم آه ستكون محاضرتنا اليوم بعنوان آه فضة إسبانية في اليمن وعملات معدنية يمنية في إقليم نيو إنجلند في القرن السابع عشر ستكون المحاضرة باللغة الإنجليزية ولكن يوجد ترجمة فورية باللغة العربية ويمكنكم تفعيلها من خلال الضغط على زر الترجمة أسفل الشاشة وهو على شكل كرة أرضية. Again, it brings me a great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on Spanish silver in Yemen and Yemeni coins in New England in the 17th century. Um, my name is Aya al -Girni. I'm a research fellow in the Yemen program here at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's event. We are very pleased to be joined by Professor Nancy Ohm, who will be our speaker for today's lecture. Uh, Nancy Ohm is Professor of Art History and Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Inclusion at Harper College of Arts and Sciences at uh, Binghamton University. Her research explores the Islamic world from the perspective of uh, the coast with a focus on mat material, visual, and built culture on the Arabian Peninsula and around the rims of the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. Her first book, uh, The Merchant Houses of Mocha, Trade and Architecture in an Indian Ocean Port, uh, which was released in 2009, uh, relies uh, upon a cross-section of visual, architectural, and textual sources to present the early modern coastal city of Mocha as a space that was nested within broader world networks, a structure to communicate with uh, far-flung ports and cities across a vast matrix of exchange. Uh, her second book, Shipped Out uh, not, But Not Sold, Material Culture and the Social Protocols of Trade During Yemen's Age of Coffee, uh, published in 2017, explores the material practices and informal social protocols that undergraded the overseas uh, trade in the 18th century Yemen. Today's webinar highlights the importance of the discovery um, of silver Yemeni coin, which was unearthed in Rhode Island. Um, now you may all be wondering what can possibly be important about this coin, um, and that is the long lost history behind it. Um, as Prof Nancy will explain, the coin serves as an entry point that will allow us to think about a number of issues that are key to our understanding of material exchange movement and circulation in the late um, 17th century in Indian Ocean and Atlantic spheres. Uh, we will see how coins can be used as evidence in oceanic material culture studies and also how coins can be thought of as physical tokens of much less tangible commercial systems uh, that crossed oceans in the 16th to 18th century. There is also a really unique uh, pirate story behind this uh, which maybe Prof. Nancy will uh, allude to. Uh, I know it's not the major part of her talk, but it's uh, definitely an interesting one to hear and one that catches the headlines most. Um, with that, Prof. Uh, Nancy will also uh, shed light on the unacknowledged connections between the mountains of Southern Arabia and colonial New England. Uh, before I hand it over to Prof. Nancy, I want to remind our audience that we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of uh, this session. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box and I will collect as many questions as time allows. Uh, without further ado, uh, Prof. Nancy, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ayael. I will uh, share my screen. Okay, I think maybe someone has to, to take their screen down. So Khlud, maybe if you, okay, beautiful. Thank you. And I will st um, or start this. Okay, can you see my first slide? Okay, I hope you can see my slide. Yes, it's clear. Okay, great. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to start by thanking Abdullah Hamid Adin for offering me the very kind invitation to speak and uh, Aya El El Karni for introducing me and for moderating, as well as Khulud El Amira and Sara El Mudaifer for organizing the details of this 
lecture. Um, and I think uh, Ahmed Haroun is offering a very kind uh, simultaneous translation. So I really appreciate that as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to presenting this new research uh, to you, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, posits some quite far reaching oceanic connections for 17th century Yemen. I'm going to warn you that this paper is going to take some twists and turns. We're going to cover a lot of ground uh, in it, uh, but I will really thank you for your patience in some of this journey that we'll take, as well as your feedback. Uh, this is a work that's very much in progress, so I'll maybe be prompting you at some moments to maybe help me out to build some of the context of this talk. So I'm actually going to be starting today not with the coin that I mentioned in Rhode Island, but this is a similar one. I'll get to the Rhode Island one in a moment, but um, this is one that was found in Maine. So a few weeks ago, I received an email from a curator at the American Numismatic Society in New York. And he sent me photographs of the small silver coin that had been excavated at an archeological site in York, Maine. And I just want to underline when we're talking about York, Maine, we are speaking about North America. I emphasize that because I rarely start my talks in North America. I usually start in Yemen or in the Indian Ocean. It is very strange for me to be talking about the continent that I'm sitting on right now. And so, as you can imagine, this coin was actually quite perplexing to those who found it. They were in the process of excavating a colonial period house. They had documentation that this house was built in the year 1642. And they also understood that the part that they were excavating had been filled in in the year 1755. So that means essentially that this coin had to have found its way to Maine and to this site sometime about 300 years ago. You can give or take a few decades in either direction. The coin is quite corroded, but it still provides valuable information. On the right, you can see the title and Nasser. And on the left, it's a bit hard to read, but it's a date that is 1101 Hijri or 1689 to 90. And when we place this coin within comparative information that we know about other Islamic coins, we can be quite certain that this coin came from Yemen and that it was minted by the Imam and Nasr Muhammad ibn Ahmed, one of Yemen's Qasimi Imams. And I'm just going to provide a little bit of context here, just in case some of you may uh, you know, want to know a little bit more about the Qasimis in general or about Muhammad ibn Ahmed in particular. Uh, so we'll just start with this image, uh, just to remind us all that the Qasimis emerged as a major presence in Northern Yemen in the early 16th century, based in the mountaintop town of Shahara. And I'm just showing you this photograph of the amazing actor bridge of Shahara. It is one of the most staggeringly beautiful sites definitely in Yemen, but I would argue anywhere in the world. And so we'll just leave this up as we contemplate the rise of the Qasimis. Um, and the Qasimis were, of course, one of the groups that opposed the Ottoman presence, which began in the year 1538 in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. But they hold the sole uh, role of having been able to eject the Ottomans from Yemen in the year 1636. And when they did that, they then gained control of a territory that stretched from the highlands to the Red Sea and the Arabian Seas. However, most of us know how this story ends. It actually ended much as it started, but in reverse, which is that the Ottomans returned for a second period of rule in the mid 19th century. And of the Qasimi Imams of Yemen, Muhammad ibn Ahmed was known as a particularly capricious and fickle Imam. And you will note that I'm calling him by his given name, Muhammad, rather than his title, which of course is a bit of a strange thing to do. But I'm doing this quite deliberately because he in fact changed his title three times. He began as a Nasr, as we saw with the coin that was found in Maine, but then he abandoned that title and he took a new title, Al-Hadi. And he only held that for a few years and then took on the title Al-Mahdi, which is the final title that he held for the rest of his life. And it's for that reason that he's often referred to as the Imam of three Al-Qab or Laqabs because of this um, changing title through his career. Similarly, he moved his ruling seat several times. He declared his Dawah in the Fort of Al-Mansura. And then he moved to a site called Al-Khadra, 
near Radha. And uh, the chroniclers tell us that he built up that city quite monumentally. But it's an interesting story. He got very ill in El Khadra. He almost died there. And he blamed his poor health on that city. And so he quickly abandoned it, despite the fact that he had built it up so nicely, um, and found his final capital, which is called El Mawah, located just to the east of the Mar. Um, and this is where his tomb is located today. And he also goes by the moniker Sahib El Mawahib because of his association with that site. Um, and you can see why I'm calling him by his given name, by Muhammad ibn Ahmed, rather than by his many titles, because he has many titles, many monikers, and, and was known in many different ways. So we'll just stick with that to be consistent. And I could go on about Muhammad ibn Ahmed, but I will stop with that and just telling you that he is particularly interesting to me in my research because his period ushered in an era that was quite vibrant in terms of Yemen's external relations. It is a period that I have called in my previous research Yemen's Age of Coffee, a time of increased interaction between the Qasimi Imams of Yemen and a number of international merchants who came to trade at their ports. They sought coffee in addition to other commodities. And although, of course, coffee has a very long history in Yemen, both its consumption and its cultivation, uh, coffee, this age of coffee, as I have termed it, really begins in the 1680s. And that is when Muhammad ibn Ahmed came to power. And that is also when coffee truly became a global habit. And this brought newcomers to Yemen shores. But this age of coffee, as I've termed it, was essentially over by 1735. And I'll, I'll say rather Yemen's age of coffee was over by 1735. Even though Yemen obviously continued to produce and export coffee, it was in that time period, right in the 1730s, when the many efforts to uh, transplant the coffee bush outside of the region were finally successful, thereby ending Yemen's hold upon this market. And I'm showing you this graphic here on the screen, which indicates some of these flows. Um, and I will say, I don't agree, I didn't make this graphic, I don't agree with every single date or a piece of information that you find on it, but I think it's quite effective in indicating to us the particular changes in cultivation and the spread of coffee in this period in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I do want to be very clear that the age of coffee is really important for us to understand Yemen's global position during this era in the 17th and 18th centuries. But I do want to be clear that it does not explain the appearance of this coin in Maine, again, sometime in the, you know, between the year 1689 and the year 1755, because indeed, American direct trade with Yemen did not begin until the late 18th century after American independence. The first ship left from the port of Salem directly to the port of Mocha, arriving in the year Uh, later. Um, and so then our question is for today, if it was not through the commercial trade that this coin arrived in New England, how did it get there? And that's going to be the topic of today's talk, while also asking what might this coin have meant? Um, and I now, in order to do this, need to open up this context a little bit and mention the coin that Ayael started with in terms of um, just painting a little bit more context here. So while that main coin is very important, particularly because it was excavated in a very uh, well-documented fashion, it is, um, uh, you know, and there's a lot of documentation for the site, so it's a very important historical artifact, it is not singular. I would like to just indicate to you that a whole corpus of coins from Yemen during this period have been found in colonial sites in New England. Um, I'm showing you four of the examples on the screen, and I want to let you know that these are not the only ones. These are just the best exemplars that I've chosen and ones that I feel quite confident about. And all four of these coins can be associated with Muhammad ibn Ahmed. You can see on the left, it is the coin is inscribed with his title and Nasr again. The one right next to it reads Al Hadi, his second title. And the two coins on the right feature the site of Al Khadra, which I described, which is associated with him. And he was the only Imam who minted coins there. 
And the one thing I want to tell you that's quite interesting and different about these coins than the ones that the one that we saw in Maine is that these were not excavated by professional archaeologists. They were found by metal detectorists. And the reason why this is so interesting is because some of you may have noticed like over the past few months in particular, there have been a large number of archaeological finds, particularly in Britain, that have been uh, located by people who are amateur archaeologists, they use metal detectors, um, and they found some extraordinary objects, uh, Bronze Age finds, Roman finds, um, and that is because um, the metal detectors that you can buy on the market today are much more sensitive and have much greater depth perception than they used to have. And so this is also one of the reasons why these Yemeni coins have been turned up. Because this equipment has improved so much, they've been able to find objects that they would not have been able to locate a few years ago. And this also just leads to another point I'd like to make that's extremely important. I absolutely expect that we are going to see more finds of these coins in future years. I think we have no sense of exactly what the scope of this is. This is just the beginning. And um, just as one other um, uh, visual here, uh, you can, uh, I've just mapped this out just so you can see where some of these coins were found um, and uh, you can just kind of get a sense of this scope, really underlining that that coin in Maine or any one of these, these were not isolated examples. There was clearly a certain amount of circulation of Yemeni coins in New England historically. And so we need to get to the bottom of this. Um, and I will say that, you know, clearly all these coins, they are slightly different. They, you know, were featured different uh, moments, different titles, different uh, mint sites, and they're not all produced in the same batch. I will say, I also believe that they did not come over all in the same ship. I believe that they came over in different batches through a period of time, but they do all represent the same denomination, okay? These are all identified as the Khamsiya. And as you can imagine, the Khamsiya is a denomination that is relative to the value of another coin. So it is a, essentially a fifth of a dirham, okay? That's a, its a worth. Um, and just to give you a sense of this here on the screen, you're looking at two views. This is not one of the coins that was found in New England. It's one that's very comparable. And you can see that the one on the, the left sits in the palm of my fairly small hand. So you can see that it's a small coin. Uh, it's about the size of a dime, I would say, in terms of American currency. Um, and on the right, you can get a sense for how thin and light it is. And of course, we correlate this directly with its value. This is a coin of very small value. But I also want to say that when I call a coin a khansiya or a dirham or use any other terms, these are attributions that are based on the weight, size, and design of the coin. And what I mean by that is it doesn't, none of these coins announce themselves on their, service, uh, their surface saying that they are a khansiya or a dirham. Um, indeed, that's quite, uh, that's quite unusual. And one of the things to note is that in Yemen, the mints were very unregulated. So Mohammed ibn Ahmed, for instance, minted a whole series of silver coins in many denominations, but it's very hard for us to tell where the categories end because there's so much range within any denomination. And this is one of the reasons why Yemeni coinage is very poorly understood. And there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done on this topic, I would say. And one last point that I want to make about these coins found in New England, and this is where uh, I might not have full information. And so if anyone who is listening has something to help me to build out this um, context, I'd be very grateful for more information. But I do not know of any of this type of coin from this period that has been excavated in Yemen. Um, and uh, so we don't you know, so this is challenging. Here with these coins in New England, we understand their context, especially the one that was very well excavated. So they become these very important historical markers that we can in fact, as I argue, use to understand coins back in Yemen that never left Yemen, even though these in fact, of course, left long ago. Okay, so with that then, um, let's talk about how these coins would have made it to North America at this time. And I'm just gonna use this map that we looked at before just to kind of ground us. Um, and we do know, we believe how these coins traveled. Um, and we have a very historically specific understanding of this. And I will tell you that it does, as I mentioned, involve pirates. So 
In the 1690s, pirates who were very active in the Caribbean and, and were, um, they were finding that their activities were being increasingly suppressed. Um, and so they knew that they had to find new targets essentially. So many of these Atlantic pirates moved to the Indian Ocean and they found quickly that they could stake out Bebel Mendeb, the opening to the Red Sea. And they understood that the timing was quite important, that if they uh, staked out this, um, this channel uh, right around the time when the pilgrimage ships were leaving the port of Jeddah, heading back to India, then they had very lucrative targets. These ships were richly laden with coins and with precious metals and with other objects. Um, and we know that the 1690s was this period of high piracy in the Indian Ocean. Many pirates who are Anglo-American, like Henry Every, a very famous pirate that was never caught, Thomas Tu, who happened to have been from Rhode Island, for instance, they were very active in this period. Okay, so this is one way in which we can imagine that those Khamsia coins might have exited from Yemen. But there's also one other part to the story that's so consequential, which is that right in the same period, in the 1690s, many American merchants, colonial American merchants, particularly from New York and Rhode Island, began to explore Madagascar as a potential slave trading partner or site rather, uh, an exploitative enterprise that they believed would be more lucrative than the West African trade. And obviously, you know, colonial North America had been long involved in West Africa. We know that West African enslaved individuals built most of the city of New York, for instance, in terms of the colonial period, right? Um, and so these um, uh, slave traders uh, started to go back and forth between Madagascar and the colonies. Those pirates that I just talked about used Madagascar as a base. And so we find that these networks of pirates and slave traders were deeply intertwined, that those slave missions sometimes transported pirates back to North America, and that sometimes these pirates also purchased enslaved individuals and brought them back to North America as well. And when the pirates came to the colonies, they had to buy off everyone they encountered so that they could have their anonymity and safe haven. And you can imagine that they were using coins that they had picked up in the Indian Ocean, okay? Um, and we actually now have a little bit more evidence to this because you can see here that there was a recent pirate shipwreck called the Speaker that went down off the coast of Mauritius. And you can see it marked here in the year 1702. We know that that was exactly one of these pirate ships that had staked out Bebel Mendeb, as I described. We even have evidence that they had seized a ship that was owned by an, an Indian merchant whose name was Abdul Ghafur, who was one of the most famous merchants who traveled the Red Sea, um, or rather the Arabian Sea Channel. Um, and he uh, was a very famous figure in Mocha uh, in Yemen as well. And so Abdul Ghafur's ship was taken um, and, and uh, when we look at the excavation of the ship, we can see some of the items that those pirates would have seized. I will tell you, we don't have all of them because not all of them have been preserved, but you should not be surprised to find that there were coins that we believe to be, again, the Yemeni Khamsia coins. And I will tell you, I literally got these slides like five days ago, so I haven't had a chance to do any deep research on this, um, but the design and the size and the weight of at least one of them definitely are, you know, inclined me to believe this in this direction. They did not send me the obverse, the other side of the coins though, so I'd need to get a little bit more information before I really comment on these, but indeed, this is the type of coin that we would have found on board that ship. Um, and we can imagine, maybe the ship was towards North America. Maybe those pirates would have carried these coins to New England, and we can think about those kinds of networks. Um, but I do want to be really clear in stating as well, though, that these silver Khamsia coins were not the only coins on this boat. That indeed, these pirates would take hauls of materials that were really diverse in terms of coinage. And let me just give you an example of this because it is germane to the rest of this talk. You can see here another coin that was pulled off of the speaker shipwreck. And again, this is a, a shipwrecked archaeological site. So this is underwater archaeology. I just want to be clear about this. And they're bringing up these objects. Obviously, objects in metal will have a more longevity than those perishable objects that were probably on board, like maybe things like textiles or certain kinds of spices, for instance, that uh, and, and food stuff that would have um, uh, not lasted over time in the underwater context. 
Um, but I just want to really highlight those coins on the top. They are um, golden sultanis um, of Ottoman uh, manufacture, minted on Ottoman authority. But I do want to indicate these were minted in Egypt, or this is it's one coin, both sides, but more than one of these types of coins was found in the shipwreck. Um, and the one other important thing to tell you about these coins, and the reason I called them this using the strange word, it's a misnomer, Arabian chikin sequin or ducat, is because when you look into colonial North American records from precisely the period we're talking about, the 1690s, this coin is referred to in that way in North American records. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that in colonial North America, we not only had the Yemeni Khamsiya that had a certain amount of circulation, we also had other coins like this one that came from the Middle East that had Arabic writing on its surface, although we know that people would not have been able to read either of these coins. And that this golden coin, the Arabian Chikin, I will tell you, actually circulated in such large quantities in colonial America that we see it on exchange rate charts, we see it on probate inventories, and it had a very wide circulation, which I just find fascinating. Like, I will tell you, I've just started this project several months ago, if someone had asked me, could you, you know, did people use coins from the Middle East in colonial North America? I will tell you no. And today I have to reverse that opinion. And I've been, you know, and I've realized that, that actually I might, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised about the arrival of these Yemeni coins all the way in North America. And it just makes me think about how interconnected the world was at this time. Um, and then the coin below I also want to talk about because it's going to be very important for what we're going to get into in just a moment. Another coin that was found on board this ship was the piece of eight, um, which also goes by the name Spanish real or Spanish dollar. Sometimes it's called the Mexican real or the Mexican dollar. And I want to be very clear about what this coin is. It is a coin that is made of silver that is mined in the Americas, primarily, but not only the mine of Potosi in Bolivia. And this was the most important silver stream in the early modern world that was controlled by the Spanish. Silver was mined there. Coins were minted on Spanish Habsburg authority. These coins circulated around the world and it's long in knowledge. They drove the Indian Ocean trade. So it is no surprise to see these Spanish reals here in the Indian Ocean because we know that they were very important to that economy. When you look at these coins, you might even be thinking in your mind, well, these don't look like coins. They're, you know, these kind of crude shapes. Um, and that's because they were what we call cobs. They were literally punched out of planks of silver. They were never finished because they didn't need to be finished. When they got to their destination point, they were often melted down and reminted into local currencies. For instance, in India, all of the currencies, were, you know, uh, that were of silver, or, you know, were produced, were were reminted from uh, and remonetized from these Spanish reals of eight. Um, and I do want to tell you that you know these pieces of eight they were very well known in the Middle East. So in Egypt, for instance, they are referred to as Abu Taka or. I guess in Egypt, maybe be Abu Ta'a, I guess, um, or Butaka, we see the sources as well. Um, and uh, and, oh, and the, the reason for that is that it was believed that if you see on the left and the, 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 the shield, that it looked like a window. That's the way it was interpreted. So that's why they called it Abu Ta'a. Um, and it is very possible that this Spanish Real would have come through the Mediterranean and then come down the Red Sea and then been seized by the pirates and come back down around headed for the Cape of Good Hope. So to me, these circulations are very fascinating. And I want to really underline that during this period, there was a great deal of fluidity of, of some of these precious currencies. I mean, in our world today, we really think about, um, you know, currencies being kind of useful within certain boundaries. But I think that that modern notion is not very relevant for this period in history. So with all of this now, let's finally get to Yemen. I know I've been, you know, taking you in all of these other directions that we need to finally get to Yemen so that we can understand this coin, these Khamsia coins that found their way all to all the way to New England. Um, and in order to do this, uh, I've got a little map there just to show you some of the places that I have been discussing. Um, we're, we're going to rest not at the site of, for instance, El Khadron near Raga, which is where those coin, many of those coins were minted, or El Mawahid, where there was also a mint. Um, but we're going to look actually at the port of Mocha or El Mocha. And the reason we are going to do that is because this was a major trading point of the Qasimi Imams on the Red Sea. And I have absolutely no doubt 
that all of those pilgrimage ships that were seized by pirates, that they stopped at Mocha before they exited through Bebel Mendeb. Every, every ship did because you had to stop there for provisions before going out on the open waters. So Mocha is absolutely relevant. And so it is no surprise then that when we get to this port, we can easily find our chamsia because I'm sure that those coins abounded there. And in order to just demonstrate this for you, I'm going to use a document. And here on the screen, we're actually looking at one of the records left by the English East India Company. And they kept very copious records of their time in Yemen based in the port of Mocha and sometimes at the coffee market of Beit al-Faki. And I worked extensively with these records, which I find to be quite rich sources for Yemen's history. Um, and I do also want to say that uh, by the year 1721, when this document was recorded, the English had been trading in Yemen for over a hundred years. So they are by no means newcomers at this time. And the document that we're looking at on the screen, and I'm sorry, I know it's not easy to read. Uh, it was photographed from microfilm. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I never like photographs from microfilm, but we have to be grateful in this time where uh, travel is so constrained to be able to have access to digital documents, even if they strain our eyes a little bit. Um, and so this is um, this document, I want to be very clear about what it is. It's called a steward's account. And it includes all of the charges that were entailed in running the English factory. They had a big house in Mocha that they lived in. Um, and, you know, they kept these records of all of the charges that were entailed in running it. Um, and I want to be really clear about that. It's extremely detailed. It literally mentions on the left, basically, and spilling over onto the right, we have essentially the grocery list of the English and you can see they, they're extremely detailed. They mentioned every chicken, egg, lime or fish that they bought in the souk of Mocha so they could feed their employees. And you might wonder why this is so detailed. I mean, I will just give you a sense that um, at this time, those people who oversaw the factory of Mocha who were based in places like Bombay and London were always suspicious of these merchants. They thought that they were trying to steal money from the company and you know engage in all these kinds of side deals. And so um, there are these, merchants who were based there were very worried about being accused of mismanagement of funds. So they kept very, very detailed records. Um, and so here in the steward's account, um, I just want to underline that all of these transactions are taking place in the format of, or the currency of the komasi, which is of course the khamsiya as it comes from the plural khamasi, right? And so um, we can see here that that coin, I'm trying to connect to you now, all of those coins that we found in New England here to the marketplace of Mocha. And you can imagine, you can even see how much everything costs um, and the merchants of this company going around, you know, paying eight, eight, eight chamsia for, you know, uh, their fish or their limes or their eggs or whatever it, it will be. They're very small numbers, even though aggregate, it does add up certainly. Uh, this is really used, that those coins were used for everyday types of things. And I'm trying to underline that this is not a coin that drove the global trade. I mean, you saw how tiny it was as well. So this all lines up with that physical evidence and understanding its value. The chamsia was a coin that was used within the retail sphere of Mocha for these local kinds of expenses. But of course, the Port of Mocha was not known for its souk, right? It was known for its international trade. And I have long made the case in my studies of the city of Mocha that there was a stark bifurcation, a divide in that city, that indeed the souk that you see on the right, and by the way, I believe this is the only remaining photograph of the souk of Mocha, which is now completely destroyed, um, but that, that you know, those kinds of transactions we just saw took place in the souk on the right, um, again, in this local sphere. But that the major Tujar or merchants of Mocha, many of whom came from places like India or the Gulf, that they did not trade in the souk. They actually traded outside of out of their houses, like that grand, this grand merchant's house that you can see here on the left that also no longer stands. And indeed, those houses were very separated from the souk of Mocha. They were stretched along the shoreline. Um, and I've even argued that these major merchants, they would not even want to enter the kind of space of the souk. They definitely wouldn't trade their goods there because it was a very different social sphere and status mattered a great deal among this community. 
And so today I'm going to extend this and really give you the sense that it was not only architecture, but also currency was quite starkly divided. So if the currency of the souk on the right was the khamsiya, then what did people use in the international trade of Yemen during this time? Well, I will say one currency that was used was a notional currency a coin of account um, that the Europeans called the mocha dollar, that in Arabic was, was referred to as kirsh daheb. And again, this is an imaginary currency. It was a currency that was used to keep books in. And the reason I'm showing you this image as I'm describing this mocha dollar and this imaginary currency is because this was a currency that was held by and um, kind of used by the brokers in the city. And the brokers in Mocha were by and large Banian merchants. And that means that they were from India, they were Jain and Hindu, they were not Muslim, and they were largely from the province of Gujarat in the Northwest. And they very much ran the, the kind of bookkeeping of the trade. They also served as uh, in the fun function as uh, saraf or money changers. Um, and uh, they were extremely central and they were really uh, kind of in charge of keeping these calendars and these accounts. But of course, as we can imagine, money had to change hands. It had to be tendered in mocha. So what currency did they use then? And here we go back, perhaps not surprisingly, to our Spanish real, our piece of aid, our Mexican dollar, whatever you want to call it, that you remember that was found on the speaker. And then I describe as the dominant global currency of the time. I'm showing you in the back here um, of those coins, just to document this one from the Dutch East India Company that shows a transaction between the Dutch and a Banian merchant named Ramzi Musi. I mean, you can see that this kind of exchange of all these goods that you can see nicely listed, spices and textiles and metals and, uh, and, uh, and uh, minerals and other types of things, as well as porcelain, these are all being paid for in Spanish reals. Okay, and I think that sounds uh, stated very clearly here. That was also the dominant currency in Beit Fakhi in the coffee market. Um, and uh, so as you're watching this, some of you may, may be kind of wondering, you know, why is she using only European documents to make the case about currencies in Yemen? And it might seem like a strange choice. I've already underlined that these documents are amazingly detailed for economic activity in Yemen during this period. I would argue, although I'll be very happy to see contradictory evidence to this point, that this is some of the best financial documentation that we have in Yemen um, you know, for this period such that the coast is understood better than the center. Um, but I, you know, I'd love to see uh, similar materials for Sana'a, for instance, but I have not yet so far for this time period. Um, but I would even go further and just say that the local documents in Arabic um, uh, are, are challenging when it comes to understanding money, okay? And what I mean by that is that there is a very, um, there's a lot of difficulty in matching up the terms for currency with actual coins. And to just give you an example of this, I think the best document to take from this time is the Qanun Sana'a, which is of course the statute of the marketplace of Sana'a that indeed was written and rewritten in the 18th century. So it's very relevant to my time period. Um, and that Qanun Sana'a uses lots of terms for money. And some of the major terms that appear in, in it are the Kirsh, the Kabir, the Buksha and the Harf. Okay, These are, there are others, but those are the major ones. And when it comes to all four of those terms, historians are divided as to if those terms are referring to actual coins, if they are referring to coins of account, so again, notional, account, notional coins or imaginary coins, or if they are referring to even standard measures of weight, because remember, almost all of these coins would be weighed rather than counted. They would be valued for their weight in their material rather than their face, again, their perceived value, okay? Um, and so this is a, a big challenge, all right? And then one of the other issues that I just want to, uh, to um, add is that all of those terms that I just mentioned for these monetary units are extremely volatile. So if you think you know what a harf is, for instance, in the Ottoman period when it was a coin of gold, by the time you get into the Qasimi period, the harf is, we believe, but are not certain that it's a coin of silver. And then when you get into closer to the modern period, that same harf is completely cut with copper and it's an extremely low value coin, right? And so because the meaning of it changes and the association of it changes, we have to be extremely careful. And this is another one of the reasons why our understanding of Yemeni coinage is so unresolved. And so I would say this is that 
you know, in my sources, I have not even found the term khamsia mentioned. And I think it's there. It's not that it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen it in my chronicles. So colleagues, if you have seen mentions of khams the khamsia from this period, please let me know. It abounds. I see it everywhere in European sources, but again, not in the local sources. I mean, I do not believe that the khamsia matches up with any of those terms that I just mentioned. I used to think so, but I have now, I have now correcting myself. I have an error in my book that was published in 2009. Let's just put it that way. Um, similarly, the Spanish real that you see here on the screen is a little bit difficult to locate in the local sources, but I will make the contention, I would love to hear what colleagues think about this if you have a stake in this, is that when, um, especially in the Qanun Sana, but it comes up in other sources as well, whenever they mention Kirsh Hajar, which is you know, a kind of sound currency or hard money, all right, um, that at least in this period, in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, that they are referring to the Spanish real, okay? Um, and I will tell you, I do not believe that this Kirsh Hajar is a coin. It is just a the idea of a hard currency to which you peg other values, like the kind of you know currency that drives a market in, in many ways. We can think about like a gold standard or something like that. Um, and the reason I'm so certain about this is that particularly in the Qanun Sana, when they talk about Kirsh Hajar and they talk about fees, they often say, oh, you need to pay an eighth of a Kirsh Hajar for this. And um, the Spanish real is called a piece of eight because they cut it into eight pieces. They literally cut the coin into these pieces so that each piece would be one real. And so they could easily pay out an eighth of a Kirsh Hajar if it was a Spanish real because it was already cut up in that way. Um, and so this contention, it might not seem to be, you know, kind of earth shattering to some of you, but the reason it's important, the reason I'm making it so vigorously is because in a few years after the period I'm talking about, this Kirsh Hajar becomes replaced by another sound currency or Kirsh Hajar, which is of course the Maria Teresa dollar, okay? And I just want to underline this currency now also foreign, but coming from Europe rather than be, you know, so European silver minted on uh, in Austria, right? Um, this comes, uh, these coins are only minted beginning in the year 1741. So it's later than the Spanish real, okay? We know that they began to circulate around the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian Ocean in the 1750s. But the reason why we all know about the Maria Teresa Thaler is because it has such longevity in Yemen and I would say across the peninsula and even across the Red Sea in you know, East Africa as well. And I'm showing you two examples of Maria Teresa Thalers, both of which I hope you'll note I've selected because they are countermarked in the 20th century, one by Imam Yahya and one from Hadramut to give you the sense of the this continuing relevance of this currency into the modern period. And I also just have to share these really amazing images that Marjorie Ransom kindly shared with me to remind us as well that women in Yemen continue to wear the Maria Teresa Thaler as part of their jewelry. I know that this is dying out and I cannot speak for Yemen um, today. Someone maybe can, can maybe help to add to this. Um, but I just want to, I'm really trying to underline that, you know, we that this is very visible, the Maria Teresa Thaler. And so as a historical consequence, what has happened is that that Spanish real has disappeared. Oh, and I should also add, when we talk about the Maria Teresa Thaler, of course, in Arabic, we sometimes call it uh, the real Faransawi, right? Um, and I don't understand why it's French, but someone, maybe someone else can tell me that. But I strongly believe that, uh, that the name of real Faransawi or real Faransa was used to at least originally to differentiate it from the Spanish real. That is just, you know, it's my speculation, but I really, really believe this because, you know, we can understand that there was a shift over. And I can talk more about this if people want to get into it. I have a lot of other documentation that I haven't shared with you. Okay, and so I'm just trying to say that then, you know, the Spanish real disappears. I'm trying to resuscitate it today. And why is this all important to our Khamsia? And I bring us back to our document here. You can see one other area that I have um, highlighted now on the right is that um, in this document, which is meant to go back to London, right? So it has to be legible to people in London. They realize that no one in London is going to know what a Khamsia is or a Kamasi is. So they convert the value back into to Spanish dollars into the real or the Kirsh Hajar, if you will. Um, and you can see 45 Khamsia for one Spanish real. And I'm gonna tell you, I dutifully weighed all these coins and indeed there's some fluctuation in the weights, but 45 Khamsia coins do equal the standard weight of a Spanish real, which was about 27 grams. So we can see this conversion, but I want to go even further and I hope you're following me here. I know I've asked a lot of you as an audience, so I understand if I'm going too far, but I just want to, to have you understand what I'm saying, which which is that 
I believe as well that those Khamsiya coins in Yemen and even the ones that we found in New England were all made and reminted from Spanish dollars. So what I'm saying is we have silver that is mined from the Americas. It finds its way to Yemen. It comes in through the ports. It gets sent up to El Khadra. The currency is demonetized by being melted down. And then it is remonetized in the format of these Khamsiya coins, a smaller currency. And then those coins, at least some of them, go out through Mocha, go around the Cape of Good Hope and land back in America in the 1690s. To me, that is an amazingly extraordinary journey for this tiny coin. And I think I will stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Nancy. That was a really fascinating overview. Um, the story of how these coins made it to North America and the even the association of the most notorious pirate uh, uh, to these coins is definitely exciting one. Um, especially that some claim that it can be used to solve uh, one of the world's oldest robbery cases. Um, but uh, the more academic story you provided though, um, about these commercial systems and connections between Yemen and colonial New England is uh, certainly a compelling one. Uh, before I take- uh, before I was just I gonna say, I hope I didn't lose anyone in all of this back and forth, going back and forth across oceans and across land, you know, bodies of water and, and land masses. Again, I realized I, I demanded a lot from this audience, so. You didn't lose me at least. <laughs> but before I take questions from our audience, who I'm sure have been following along, um, I will use my privileges as a moderator to ask some of my own uh, questions first. Um, and uh, our audience today are not all historians or archaeologists, so um, we have a good mix of people from different backgrounds, and I'll try to keep my questions um, in general, but still relevant to today's topic. Um, I want to start with the uh, Port of Mocha. As you mentioned, uh, uh, Mocha served as a key international com commercial hub. Um, and it had in place a, a double system of currency in which international um, wholesale currencies coexisted with the local ones, um, the Spanish real, the notional uh, currency or Mocha dollar, and the Hamsiya, and later on the Maria Teresa uh, Poller. Um, so at times different certain units were more dominant, uh, if I understood correctly, um, such as the Spanish real, as you mentioned. I'm curious to know whether uh, those who used the Spanish real held a prime status in society. And so essentially, did the type of silver currency used uh, grant individuals a certain status in society? Yes, no, that's a terrific question. And um, indeed, that is just an extension of what I've been really trying to argue here today, right? That especially in the city of Mocha, you know, I, I've um, it's very common for us to focus on the international trade because as you've seen, I mean, part of my point is I, we have a lot of documentation about that trade and that's what I tried to share with you um, in today's talk, at least, you know, very small pieces of that. Um, and so we know a lot about these major traders. Uh, you know, I mentioned Abdul Ghafoor, who is this major trader based in the city of Surat in India. Um, he made his, um, his, his fortune through shipping, actually. Um, you know, and someone like him would obviously be, you know, uh, just uh, overflowing with these precious metals from afar, right? And I would say, you know, those gold coins that we saw as well would have been found in, Mo in Mocha, but not in large numbers. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that um, Mohammed ibn Ahmed, during his period, it's been noted by coin specialists that there is, um, he, he starts just minting so much silver. To the exclusion of gold, his father, uh, Imam uh, Al Mahdi Ahmed, did mint some gold, but his son didn't. So Muhammad ibn Ahmed didn't. He also mints very little copper. And my suspicion is because there's so much silver coming in through the trade and through the ports that he just becomes, it becomes a single metallic system, which is very, very interesting um, in, in Yemen. And so we, we definitely see that there's, you know, that there's this kind of um, these, these tiers, but we also see how silver is just, you know, kind of driving these various registers of trade activity across Yemen. And, and, uh, and I think that's part of my point to kind of think about the very different world in which these two circulated, um, but at the same time, they followed some of the same paths, right? Um, and then as I'm trying to argue, they were all made from silver that came from the same place, I believe. 
but I, to, but to really be sure about that, we do have to do XRF um, imaging and I have not yet done that, but that's my hope soon. Uh, let me ask one more question of mine. Um, so also um, it's uh, on this currency topic, of course. So if I understood cor correctly, international trade created this monetary demand for coins that um, can be used both locally and across borders. Um, and this was like, this created an exchange system and um, you mentioned also that the value of money was based on the intrinsic value um, in metal, like the type and weight um, and not the authority upon which they were minted, um, mm -hmm. right? So um, this makes me question at what point in history did we develop this currency market uh, whereby the stability of a particular monarchy or government affects the value of the yes. currency. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a great question. And it's going to go far beyond my, my period and my expertise. Uh, but, uh, you know, definitely um, what, you know, uh, it's a much more modern notion. Right, that we, you know, and this whole idea about, I mean, it's amazing to think, and I did not get into this in this paper. Um, if we think about colonial North America, which is not my specialty, so I, you know, I've got to be very, very careful in talking about colonial North America, but, you know, they did not have, they were not allowed to mint coins. Okay, in, in you know in, in North America until you know in, after independence, um, so they had to rely on out external coins. There was a, there were actually restrictions, even though it was an, a, a, an English colony. There were restrictions on sterling leaving um, uh, England coming to the colonies, um, and so uh, they did mint the coins very briefly. But there was always a dearth. There was just a lack of coinage, and so one can understand why someone would want to use the chamsia, because they needed coins. And I will say in particular, and this is interesting when we think about value, is it was said particularly that in the colonies, they didn't have small change. And I think everyone has been in the position where sometimes you need a small small bill rather than a big bill, right? Someone in front of you only can take a small bill or, you know, at least in the, you know, in the States, you stand in front of a machine, you need a $1 bill, but you only have a $20 bill. We sometimes get in a position where a smaller denomination is more valuable to us at that time, right? Um, and so, um, so I believe, and again, this is total speculation. I don't know how I could ever prove this, but the value of the Khamsia came from the fact that it was a, a small, small value coin. Um, and so, you know, so people, it was, it was useful, I will say. It was not more valuable, but it was more useful in American circumstances. And the one other thing I want to mention, um, that document I showed you from the English, I didn't um, get into the other side of it because uh, for you know, lack of time, but it's really interesting because if you start looking down that list, it shows salaries and you can tell who is being paid in Spanish real, mostly the foreigners, and you can tell who is being paid in Khamsia, because the Khamsia, because it's um, fractional, it's like, you know, if you're, you're being paid 10.72 Spanish reals, you can tell that that was paid in another currency and was um, was converted. And so it was very, very interesting to see those two realms kind of come together. I hope that answered your question, Ayaya. Really uh, fascinating how, and it really uh, counterintuitive to think that uh, a lower value um, coin or currency can, you know, get its basically um, you know, become famous for exactly just that reason. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, we have a couple of questions from Dr. Abdullah and uh, uh, he, he asks first to, if you can give us uh, an idea about the Indian Ocean Exchanges Project and how this uh, discussion fits into that. And, okay. uh, yes, I see. I see. He has many questions for me. I have the Q and A open, so I, maybe I'll just go through all of, uh, through, through some of these. So, uh, first of all, uh, whatever one you you like. Okay. Okay. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Abdullah. It's very nice to. I, I wish we could all be present together. That would be it would even have been nicer. But I really appreciate uh, the interest in this topic and the chance to address this audience in Riyadh and around the world. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, I'm working on this. Indian Ocean Exchanges project right now, which is about um, uh, trying to connect scholars in the Indian Ocean together, all of whom are working on topics like mine that are about material culture and its circulation um, and thinking very trans-regionally, which is really the core of my work. And so indeed this project uh, hooks into that thinking. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, but, uh, but he asked, were there coins associated with other imams? And yeah, so I will tell you, 
in the group, and I can give you the article that you can, so you can look at some of this. Um, there is one that is proposed to be a coin of El Mutawakil Ismail. Okay, and I'm going to tell you though that I've never seen any of these coins myself. The uh, reproduction of the coin that is supposed to be the earlier coin from El Mutawakil Ismail um, is. Um, it's very hard for me to read based on the reproduction. And so I, I, I don't like to, uh, I cannot speak for something that I cannot vouch for. So for instance, there were many other coins that were discovered that they claimed were also, um, uh, you know, Muhammad ibn Ahmed from El Khudra. I couldn't, I could not, they were very damaged. So because I, I don't have confidence, I'm, I'm not going to include them. So there is a bigger corpus and indeed one that is believed to be earlier. Um, and there's also among that corpus, um, an Ottoman Akja that was found as well. Um, and I will say just so you know too, there has been um, in this larger topic, there were some um, uh, Maghrebi coins that were found in North Carolina as well. And so, so, you know, this is a kind of a topic that actually has a lot of depth to it that I, I, I was not aware of. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. Um, Okay, so uh, he is. So I, I'm going to uh, make sure I understand this. So uh, Abdullah is asking about the location shows that the coins were found in port cities as well as the interior regions. And he's asking about the local usage then, I believe, of the Khamsiya and the Spanish Real. So, um, and you know, to what extent I think it kind of went into the interior. I mean, I will say with the Spanish Real, absolutely. You know, I, I as I've described, I see it in the Qanun Sana, even though it's called something else, it's understood as something else. And I'm going to tell you, it's confusing because sometimes the Kirsch Hajar refers to the Real Faransawi and sometimes it refers to the Spanish Real. And so it's it's just really confusing unless you, you know, really kind of make that connection. And this is what I'm trying to inject in this. But indeed, absolutely that silver went all the way into the highlands. And remember, it was being reminted in the highlands too. Um, Muhammad ibn Ahmed only minted coins in um, uh, in the Mar, in Al Khudra, in Rada, Al Bawahib, and Sana. Those were his only mints, as far as I know. Um, and so they had to come in to be reminted. Um, in terms of the Khamsiya, I will tell you that, and I know this from not any of the sources I've shared with you today, but from, of course, the very famous Karsten Niebuhr, who was the um, a uh, Danish traveler who was, uh, or, or German traveler, excuse me, who was part of the Danish mission in 1763. Um, and uh, he talks about uh, the, the Khamsiya and uh, being used in Mocha in the Southern Tehama and a coin called the Bel the Bali, I think, the Bali, or that, that was used in al -Luhaya. And he says, in Mocha, they won't accept the Bali, in al -Luhaya, they won't accept the Khamsiya. And you know, again, this is just a passing comment, I don't know. So we, we even had the idea that there were differentiations within different ports. Um, and as I think I've described, I have great evidence for the Khamsiya circulation in, in Mocha and in, in, you know, in that port. I just don't have as much for the interior. Um, so I, you know, so I, I, I don't speak about things that I don't know about, or I try not to, let's say, <laughs> because so, um, you know, so I'm probably circulating, but again, I, I just don't, I don't understand. I haven't seen the evidence of that scope and, and what it, and what it meant, but obviously it was being, it was being minted up there, right? So it must have, but, um, but I, I, I feel like we've got all this evidence from the coast. And so I'm kind of working from that, side that coastal part uh, inland rather than the other way around if shall i, I just keep, if keep I'm, answering or or shall i i'm sorry uh, i'm intervene here for a second uh, mm -hmm. i specifically i'm interested in his fifth dr abel's fifth question um if the khamsiya was a local currency what would explain its travel so far for example did the mocha dollar travel in the same way and i would just add to that um my question about uh, the value of this uh, Hamsiya in uh, North America, um, you know, despite the fact that, so sorry, um, it was not the only coin that was found, found there. It's not a unique arrival. And, uh, you know, it joined other coins, as, as I understood you mentioned. Um, do we know how dominant it was in this dynamic system and uh, how widely circulated it was? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. So I, I would say, I think that it did not circulate very widely. I think that there were some pirates who brought handfuls of them. I mean, literally what we have to imagine is, and I mean, this is, it takes, it really takes the imagination and that's all I can rely on right now is that these pirates would encounter these ships that would leave through Beben Mendeb. They were full of different coinage that was probably in chess, 
right? Um, most of this was probably, you know, hard currency of Spanish reals. There are other currencies I didn't mention because of lack of time, like the Dutch lion dollar, which by the way, in Arabic was called Abu Kelb. It had a lion on it and they thought the lion looked like a dog. <laughs> I guess that was kind of very funny, the, 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 um, uh, the way it was referred to. Um, and that, that uh, Abu Kelb was um, a, a much lower um, content of silver. That's why people didn't like it. Uh, they prefer the Spanish real to that, I'll say. Um, but you know, so there's all these coins. You know, some of them gold, some of them silver, and um, and there are these Yemeni Khamsia coins that are mixed in there, right? I imagine, you know, or uh, you know, or maybe someone has you know a sack of coins that they have a few Khamsia coins in with all these other kinds of silver, and the pirates come on board. They seize this. They bring it onto their own ship, and then you know when they end up in North America, they literally are bribing people. So that, you know, because so that they don't call the authorities so that they get arrested because, you know, there were warrants out for their arrest and people knew that they were these very shady figures. And so they would then spend these coins along the way paying people so that they could be safe and so they could run away and they could hide their identities. And those Khamsia coins were part of that. OK, I mean, what's so interesting, though, is that the Khamsia coin we have found underground, right, in these archaeological sites, the Arabian Shakin or the Ottoman Sultani, we do not have a single one in North America, but it's mentioned all the time in the documents. You, they always, you hear a great deal about the golden Arabian ducat is what they're called, the golden Arabian sequin. But you don't hear about the Khamsia, mainly because it's very hard. I think people didn't, would not have called it that. They didn't know it was a Khamsia in America, right? But so very interesting kind of visibility and invisibility. Um, and, uh, and again, the reason why I think it, was, it had value in North America, why it wasn't melted down immediately is because they needed small change. I think that's just, that is the answer to this, to that question. They really didn't have any. They're always talking about how they needed small change. I mean, in that way, again, it was more useful than the Spanish real potentially. Um, and then with the Mokodala, it, it did not travel because it was it was not a coin. It was a, it was a coin of account. It was a bookkeeping denomination, all right? But what's so interesting is it was kept by the Banian. So it was really kind of drawn from the system that brought us back to Indian calendars. And this is the thing about the port of Mocha such a dynamic port where there's so many systems coming together and you see that with the coinage as well and you see that with the systems um, and you know that is what has kept me so fascinated by this port for so many years. Uh, I just have a quick uh, funny remark about you know the coin you mentioned of, of Abu Kelb and how it's uh, of low value. We have a saying here in Saudi Arabia not, it's a very informal saying. When when they refer to something as Abu Kel, it means it's really poor quality. So it's very interesting that you know. I wonder if it's from if it, it you know if the, this is a etymology. Maybe yeah, but that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have the butaka, and then we have the Abu Kel, and you know, and um, I will say too that. Historians have had a, had a hard time figuring out what are these things because if you know, there's nothing that makes you understand if you heard a butaka how would you know what that is right and they come you know, they started coming up in the sources a great deal um, and and we I'm working with a group um, that has been putting together this big glossary of of coinage and currency and a lot of difficulties though in making sense of some of this because of the volatility of the language as well. Certainly, it's very interesting. Uh, let's take another question from Dr. Abdullah. Um, do you want to pick your own question? Because there's so many. Sure. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, oh so, so this is an interesting question, uh, number four, where he's asking about the connection between the English and Yemen and the English in the colonies, right? I and mean, it's so interesting to think about, right? That, you know, we're dealing with obviously, a, you know, an English colony in North America and then the English trading there. You know, those, those networks were not connected, I will say. Um, you know, they were not connected in that way. I, you know, I described this very particular movement of coins from yeah you know from Yemen to to New England through those pirate circuits and through the slave trade and I would say as well it's very historically localized that's that's important to know it really I would say maybe as early as 1685 but definitely over by 1710 for a few reasons one is because the Americans they started to look at the um, at the Madagascar slave networks and they thought it would be lucrative it turned out not to work out for them because they um, they had a lot of problems on Madagascar and then so they, they stopped 
they stopped engaging in that trade in Madagascar. They did come back later on, but that was, you know, so that was a very short period of time. And of course, one of the things that happens in the Indian Ocean is that those same pirates that I was talking about who really felt like they had hit the jackpot when they would stake out Bevan Manda, they realized, oh, this is e easy targets. And I will add as well, they felt as if they could plunder Muslim ships with impunity. They felt that one of the, you know, they, because they were not other Christians, that they, you know, that they, they found them to be very, um, you know, they, they stake them out as targets with, you know, uh, particularly, I want to be clear about that. Um, but uh, because the they had engaged in such um, atrocious acts, particularly Henry Every, this very famous pirate who um, uh, was operating in the Indian Ocean in, uh, in 1695, um, that the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb got extremely angry about this. He imprisoned all of the English uh, factors who were on the coast of, um, of Gujarat. Um, and uh, finally the crown began to crack down on pirates because they realized that it was not in their interest in allowing these pirates to, to roam. So we're really dealing, dealing with this very, very short period of time of the 1690s, very particular phenomenon, but this phenomenon that left this trace all the way in New England. So um, I see a question from uh, Abdul Wahab. Uh, let's see, uh, where to find? Oh, I would like to find out more about these Caribbean pirates. Um, I can send some sources, maybe. I, I, uh, there is um, there's a great book called, um, I, I'll put it in the chat. It's called, yeah, I'll get, you should start here. And this is a kind of um, popular book. It's called The Enemy of All Mankind, okay? And it has a very provocative title. So uh, I hope that Abdul Wahab can, find this book. I'm sure you can find it, you know, even an ebook, uh, e-copy of it. It's about this very famous pirate, Henry Every, and it's a very exciting story. So I would start there. Um, and if you would like to find more resources, uh, please let me know and I could pass on. There's a lot of interesting ideas here um, that, uh, that, again, some of which have been popularized. So. Thank you for sharing the title of the book. I will certainly check it out myself as well. Um, one more question. Um, or uh, from mine before I take some of the audience uh, and give them more time to, you know, I encourage you to ask and use this opportunity with uh, Professor Nancy to ask any of your questions. She's very generous with her answers and time. Um, so in the beginning of your lecture, you, uh, lecture, you mentioned that, um, you know, technology is advancing so fast and it's allowing for these metal detectors to um, kind of pick up on these coins and, and that you expect to see more fines in the coming years or months. Um, is there a certain missing piece of the puzzle in, in, or in your work, uh, a gap that you are looking forward to, to, to come up or that you want to see turn up? Yeah, I know that this is such a great question. And, and the whole metal detector thing, I think it is so fascinating um, because, you know, and we hear a lot about it a lot in the news, right? It, the, I mentioned it, particularly in Britain right now, it's very, very popular. And they've been extremely successful in finding these materials and these objects. Um, but I do want to be clear though, and this is really important that um, professional archeologists often are extremely critical of these metal detector hobbyists because, um, you know, archaeology is not only about finding treasure, it's about context, it's about documentation, it's about scholarship. Uh, professional archaeological work is often very slow because it takes time to do this work. Um, and uh, when it comes to these metal detectors, some of them are not working in that way. And some of them really are trying to cash out on what they find, right? And that is contrary to the spirit of, um, you know, of the academic study of archaeology, right? And so I do want to be clear that it's um, a little bit of a friction, a little bit of tension there. Um, but uh, I definitely think that they're going to find more. Um, and I will say that coin I started with in Maine. I mean, that one literally I only heard about a few weeks ago. I was dealing with the other ones before. I mean, in some ways that for me was really the linchpin. It was the center because I um, I had I was worried about presenting only about these coins that were entirely uh, you know discovered by metal detectors because of those problems I described. So to find to have one come up that was professionally excavated, very well documented to me, that helps us make the case. Um, but I will tell you one thing I'm going to be doing. I hope 
is I want to review all of the coins of the period of, of Muhammad ibn Ahmed because there are many in the American Numismatic Society, there's some in the British Museum. Um, I will tell you that there are, I'm certain, in the National Museum of Sana'a, many of them, but just to let you all know, um, the coin catalogs of the National Museum of Sana'a, only half of them have been published, only the early part. And of course, people like earlier material, so they, you know, the early Islamic material um, is being published, but this material that's later has not yet been published. So I do not know what is held in Sana'a. And I regret to say it's been so many years since I've had the privilege of visiting Yemen and, and visiting Sana'a and doing, doing the work that you know, I uh, so desperately want to do that, um, that uh, I only hope for a day when I can go back and uh, do this work uh, as well uh, in, in Sana'a and uh, in Yemen and, um, and, uh, and work with the materials that are there. Until then, I do uh, propose though, to work with um, coins that are in local collections here, of which there are many, I will say. Um, and I think hopefully to better understand some of these coins with the premise that, you know, all the stuff happening in, in North America is really helping us understand Yemen better, I, I believe. So, you know, which is, which is exciting. Sure, I, I definitely, I mean, I, I hope that you can resume your uh, work in Yemen as well. And, and I hope, you know, once, um, the war is over, everyone can also uh, have the chance to visit Yemen one day. Um, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, okay. Uh, let's take more questions if uh, that's okay. Um, Dr. Abdullah says in a, in a previous lecture, you said that these findings, uh, the findings of the coin is a reflection of a rupture in global trade rather than an integration of that trade. I think he is asking if you can elaborate more on that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I was trying to make the case about is that, um, you know, seeing that Yemeni coin appear in, uh, or those Yemeni coins appearing in New England, one might be, um, you know, want to say, oh, this is, you know, an indication of the global interconnectedness of the world, right? You know what I'm saying? These kind of, you know, broad general generalities about connection um, and trade and, um, and, and indeed, I mean, it is to a certain extent. But what I think is so important is to just really understand in the place where that coin was meant to circulate in Yemen, what its meaning was, because it was not meant to be a coin that was used for that purpose. It was not a coin that was produced to have value outside of the local region. And I even described how, even if you're gonna to go to El Hayya, which is not that far away from, you know, from, from Mocha or from El Khudra, that they're saying, yeah, we won't accept that coin, right? So it's very interesting to think about the, think about the purview. Um, and, uh, and this is very unlike those coins like the Spanish Real, which was minted precisely to have value abroad, right? And so I really tried to differentiate that and to understand that those are very, very different kinds of objects while also understanding that they were also connected in this way, you know, that I think is in a very material way, right? They are of the same substance is really my, you know, my argument. Uh, right. And and even in Mocha, um, the Khamsiya was only used in retail, right? And like it had a specific, uh, you know, kind of use. So yes, they were yes. these currencies. Yeah, and I'm telling you, if you look really closely, the, so the stu that stewards register that I showed you, I know it looks like a ridiculously boring document, but to me, it's fascinating that we have all of that information, that I can tell you how much a chicken costs in the souk of Mocha in the year 1721, even though I suspect that the English were probably paying more for their chicken than theirs worth. <laughs> but again, that's a, that's, a different, that's a different story. But you know, we have these documents that tell us all this stuff about values, about, um, about who is being paid what, we can see see how much the English were paying the, you know, the barber who would come in or the person who would uh, wash the stable or, you know, a bale of hay. Um, and you can again see in those numbers that some of that is being paid in Khamsiya because of the conversion, like on, on, on the document. And so it's just fascinating that you could actually get into that. So in such a granular way, looking at the document. And so I've had a lot of fun with those um, because I think, I know that they were not meant for me to ask these questions, but they have opened up a kind of, you know, ability to think about uh, those exchanges in ways that are remarkably concrete. Mm -hmm. um about those numbers, can we use those numbers to um, kind of learn about how, how currency helped colonial efforts? Mm, this is such a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, 
a lot of people have done a lot of work, economic history work with some of those numbers, they're asking very different questions than I am. You know, they're looking for kind of large scale patterns. And so you can definitely do that. You know, I will say we have some problems like with the coffee trade, for instance, you know, those records are so detailed. We can tell you exactly how much coffee the Dutch were buying every single day of the early 18th century. And we can tell you exactly how much they were paying for it. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Um, but we also know, and I just always want to underline this, that of course they were not the major traders at that port in term or, or rather I will let, let me re revise they were not the major major buyers of coffee in Yemen the biggest buyers of coffee in Yemen were coming from Cairo and it was headed for the Mediterranean and we have some of those numbers not from Yemen as far as I know I've never been able to find any of that accounting from the market in Yemen but we have them from Kyrene registers but it's partial so it's very hard when you have very full information, like literally to the gram, I would say, hey, you know, and to the really the scent, you know, really granular for the for like the Dutch. But then you have very partial, uneven information for those who were much bigger buyers. It makes the Dutch seem as if they were outsized players than they were, right? And so there's some problems with those numbers because of their survival that seem to be um, uh, just uneven, imbalanced, I would say. Very interesting. I would be very interested to learn more about, you know, other works about uh, on this topic of, you know, as mentioned, the colonial efforts and how um, they they look at the, you know, other experts look at trends and, and try to extrapolate some certain kind of findings. Um, very interesting. I'm just looking through uh, Dr. Abdullah's questions to uh, do you, do you want to do you have a certain preference? I, I, I feel as if I answered most of them. I, 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 um, I'm not sure if there's anything left to say. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure if there's any other questions, but um, okay, yes, I, I have many questions of my own. Um, this one is about your use of um, Dutch sources. Um, and I, I know you mentioned that um, there weren't many detailed um, local sources, but, you know, uh, with, this, with the same level of detail of the transnational history. Do you know why um, that is, why local populations did not um, you know, document this yeah. and why the Spanish real is difficult to find in local sources? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I will say, um, so, you know, very specifically that I'm talking about these financial matters and these nitty gritty financial matters. Um, of course, the period of Mohammed ibn Ahmed is a huge moment of fluorescence in Yemeni writing um, on the, uh, issues of theology, of law, philosophy. Uh, Mohammed ibn Ahmed, I will say himself, was not erudite, um, and I was, you know, and um, uh, Bernard Heichel has made the great point that uh, Muhammad ibn Ahmed really was a kind of turning point in the Qasimi imamate, that the imams who came before him were seen as the ideal imams who uh, encapsulated all of the ideal characteristics of, of, the, of a Zaydi imam, whereas Muhammad ibn Ahmed apparently wrote one, one, one piece of um, scholarship that was considered to be incomprehensible. So he was not of that caliber of those predecessors, I want to say. Um, but so it's important to understand, I really want to underline that we're really talking about about uh, you know, a huge explosion of writing and scholarship in Yemen uh, precisely during that period, um, but not about economic matters, right? But about, about other matters that were of consequence. Um, and, I, and I will also be very honest in saying, I have not combed through every single one of those, of those studies that I just mentioned. I, I've actually you know, read, read very few of them. So these questions that I'm asking perhaps may be answered in them, but I do have to lean on my other colleagues who might be uh, much more um, accomplished in that area to let me know if there's something that I'm missing in, in that in that area. Um, and so, uh, so uh, of course, it's just a very exciting time of in scholarship, but the this, it was not, you know, uh, I mean, we also have to remember too, um, you know, the, the, the imams were not really supposed to be engaged with these worldly matters of exchange and trade, right? And so, um, you know, it was, you know, not really a, a, an appropriate subject matter, I would say as well, right? Uh, but what I do know from the European sources, I will say, is that 
even if that was not the you know expectation um they were they were really involved in the mundane running of these ports and you know bringing the revenue in and um and profiting from the trade and so but it's not something that is written about to the extent that other matters are dealt with so it's a very interesting imbalance which also adds to the reason why i have indeed leaned heavily upon those European sources, understanding that I know they've got lots and lots of problems, um, but they just open up a window that is just, you know, I, I cannot find something similar. Um, and being someone who's so interested in commerce, it's, you know, it's uh, necessary. Right. We, I'm, I, we're so glad to have these European recordings and documentations. Uh, they, they have proved very, very useful in today's time. Yeah, and you know, I, and I would just say, just as an addition, we you know we talked about the difficulties of doing doing research in Yemen right now under the current conditions. So um, I have been extremely fortunate in that uh, I have been able to continue to visit archives. I've also, as you can probably see, worked in museum collections that are outside of Yemen. You know, hopefully, again with the the goal that when when research can resume. You know, I'll be back, but uh, so I'm grateful to have been sustained by these materials that have been external, and I that and I that I argue are indeed uh, extremely important. Um, so uh, Salma has a question. I think shall I shall I uh, answer that? Uh, I, uh, Please go ahead. So is is asking about are these coins examples of the localization of a universal desire to safeguard trade and payment? I don't think so, actually. It's an interesting question. I mean, I really think this is, you know, um, uh, uh, there were many attempts by the Qasimis to safeguard their trade, to uh, make sure that they were profiting from the trade, to curtail the liberties and the activities of merchants, particularly the Europeans. Um, who, of course, were very, very uh, unwilling to yield to local demands, largely because they didn't get it. They didn't understand how you're supposed to trade in Yemen. And so they always were mad when someone would ask them to do something that they thought they weren't supposed to do. Right. So it was, the, the, the uh, European records are hilarious because they're just, you know, lists of grievances. You know, <laughs> they're always mad about something. They always feel as if they are being somehow, you know, tricked or being, uh, you know, shortchanged or something like that. So it's very interesting. So I would say I don't think the coins are an example of that, but I will say the history of this moment of trade is one in which there was a great deal of desire to um, try to um, yeah, control what was a trade that was was rising and was changing, right? Uh, you know, these Europeans uh, by this point had been in Yemen for many, many years and had been in the Indian Ocean for, for many, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a clear awareness of what they could do and the damage they could cause. And I want to remind you that the, uh, the English came with warships to Mocha in the year 1727. They left immediately. They didn't fire on the city. The French showed up with their warships in 1737 and did fire on the city and had to have a, um, uh, a peace treaty that is still uh, preserved in French, by the way, um, uh, with, uh, the, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the imam, as well as the local governor who was, uh, who's, uh, named, uh, who's named Ahmed Khazandar, who was, I think, the most hated figure in Mocha's history, at least by the Europeans. So, uh, so there's, there's a lot of stories about that, but I, I don't think the coins figure into them necessarily. But um, I, I, you know, I do have to get on the plane as well, uh, like very shortly. So I wonder if we could maybe ask the final question. I, I don't want to cut this short, but. Uh... Uh, of course, actually, we are almost out of time. I do see someone has their hand up, but um, I'm not sure who that is. And if Maybe. I can, um, but either way, I think you gave us so much information in this lecture today. And I truly thank you for your time and for talking to us about this fascinating topic, which has certainly evoked my interest in it and which I will most likely um, further explore. Um, I also want to thank our audience um, for joining the Yemen's program first public lecture. And uh, we, we certainly hope that you can join us in future talks. Uh, I want to thank our translator. And uh, once again, thank you everyone uh, very much for a great webinar. And on that note, I will end. Uh, good night. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a safe trip. <laughs> thank you.